It's the Life Upfront Engineering Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Waters, covering ideas, people, and products on the cutting edge of product development. As always, join the conversation at lifeupfront.com. Today on the show, an engineering leader, writer, expert in DFMA, trees, and the human side of engineering. And I like to call him the Seth Godin of engineering, Mike Shapolsky. Welcome. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Thanks a lot. Hey, my pleasure. Mike, we met, um, it must have been in the early, no, mid-90s. I was working for a CFD company at the time, and you were one of the progressive first customers that I had um, working on plasma torch cutting machines, correct? That's correct. That was some time ago. <laughs> and uh, we've, we've sort of lost uh, touch with each other. We don't sit down and have lunch every other week, but uh, I feel like we've stayed connected because you are one of, if not the most prolific bloggers in the engineering space that uh, my readers may not be aware of. Uh, yeah, um, I've been doing it for going on three and a half years of Wednesdays. I haven't missed a Wednesday and uh, haven't repeated. So uh, I, it's what I do. Now, I, I can attest to this, uh, you know, setting a goal of putting out a blog post every Wednesday ain't for the meek of heart. It is tough to stay on that schedule. <laughs> it it really is. And, you know, you almost do yourself a, a disservice by starting and stopping. But, you know, uh, because once you start, it's like rust. You just have to keep it up. Uh, you know, people uh, expect it and anticipate it. And, uh, you know, that's what it's all about. Now. In reality, I'm just a sales and marketing guy who used to be an engineer once upon a time, a, a real engineer. But uh, you're out there in the trenches now. You, you are uh, an executive or at least an, uh, an engineering leader leading a team of engineers. Um, and you've been through real engineering in a few different companies out there. Um, can you give us a little background on where you come from and how you got into this? Sure. Yeah, I uh, started with uh, GE aircraft engines, and uh, we did a lot of analysis there. I went back and got my uh, master's and PhD, and went back to GE's corporate research and development lab, where there was a, a you know, just 600 PhDs uh, supporting the 12 business units at, at GE. And then I left uh, there. I went to a startup manufacturing company, uh, pressing metal powders into parts, and uh, a lot of stress analysis on uh, tooling, and then uh, with Hypertherm designing uh, uh, plasma arc cutters. Been doing that for a long time. You know, really hands-on product development work, and uh, you know, understanding when to test, uh, uh, when to analyze, when to do both. Uh, you know, interesting question uh, that uh, we struggle with is how you know is it when is the design ready enough to launch? And you know, I think analysis and testing uh, and engineering you know, go right to the heart of, of that question. Well, well, let's, let's dig into just the tool side of things for a minute. And by tool sure. in my world, I mean uh, software tool, <laughs> Sure. but um, you know, you, if, 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 you know, you read through some of your posts, um, one thing I really like about your writing is you keep coming back to the human element. It's okay. We've got great tools out there. Um, but, but how do humans get the job done with those tools or without them? Um, so before we get into that much meatier subject, um, I'd like to hear just a, a little bit since you've been around CAE for a while and progressive enough to try it in the early days, even, um, you know, wh- what have, what have you seen as successful? What, what kind of tools have you been exposed to, or have you exposed your teams to over the years? Uh, well, I think f- for me as a mechanical, uh, person, um, stress analysis has, has been, um, uh, uh, a vital part of it. So uh, I, I mentioned uh, powdered metallurgy tooling. Uh, you know, you need to know it, uh, how many cycles the the, the tools are going to last, and that's coupling the stress with the with the uh, uh, cycling and you know fatigue life stuff. Um, and and uh, in aircraft engines um, and uh, with plasma, the temperature is is an issue. So both the uh, the strength of the materials. Um, uh, at temperature, but also the uh, the the temperature itself, the kind of uh, heat transfer analysis. Um, you know, is this is this thing going to melt, and uh, or uh, what temperature will it be, so that we can figure out if the material properties are going to be 
appropriate for the application. Um, and in, uh, you know, gas delivery systems and, and valving, you know, it's uh, what are the pressure drops? Uh, what are the flows? Uh, you know, will this orifice uh, do, do uh, what we want? Will it reduce the flow and it and uh you know dynamically over time how what what is it how does the system react and you know again uh fluids of pumps you know it's a simple thing pumping water um uh until you try to do it and uh, you know the simplest thing like a, a gland design uh in a in a in a hose or a torch lead you know if you get this the the wrong restriction or a, a bulge you know the the pressure requirements can uh, exceed the pump's ability to deliver, and and uh, it's not good. So, my focus has been largely uh, all aspects of the, the mechanical domain. How do you view the difference between uh, accuracy in simulation and what you see out in a prototype in a physical test? Well, um, I think that's a it's an interesting uh, uh, question. For me, uh, I think it, it it evolves. The first the first test for me is usually a physical one, meaning break it and and uh, break it and measure measure the some something whether it's a a stress or a, a weight or you're hanging a weight off something, and and then um, look at it, and then the, now you're ready to build uh, a model and, and simulate and and. That goes to me to this accuracy question. Um, you know, the, the beauty of the tools now is when you mesh something, it, it will converge. Meaning, it'll and and when you when you run an analysis, almost independent of the silliness of the boundary conditions, it'll run. So the question used to be, can you get the analysis to run? That was some time ago. Now it's um, it's going to give you a result. Does this make sense? You know, sure, the colors are nice, but are the patterns and the shapes of the contours, whether it's a stress or thermal, are they right? And and uh, that that uh, comes before uh, accuracy. And and I think that uh, we miss a little bit of that uh, kind of first pass um, uh, interpretation of the model. If you don't get that right, you never get to answering. The accuracy question, and and I started, I started by uh, saying, you know, you do a physical test first. Once you pass the 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 smell test of, yeah, my boundary conditions are right, and the thing looks like um, it makes sense, then you can go and try to calibrate with the experimental results uh, w- with testing. One of the things that uh, I see you writing about a lot is uh, so- something that's a little bit outside of uh, software, it's more about a way of thinking about a product, and that's uh, DFMA, so Design for Manufacturability and Assembly, correct? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. And uh, you are, you actually do a lot of speaking on this subject. I see you uh, you know, giving presentations at various conferences for that. There's one coming up next week. I don't know if you're presenting there. Yes, I am. Yes, I am, in Rhode Island coming up. And uh, there's a there's a really weird connection that I don't think you and I have talked about. Uh, so Boothroyd and Dewhurst is probably the most well known software company for software that supports DFMA. That's correct. Yes. And uh, they're you know they they came out of the University of Rhode Island URI. Yep. My wife is a um, engineer who went to URI and studied under. Now I, I feel terrible because I don't I can't remember whether it was Boothroyd or Dewhurst but one of them. <laughs> so she's, um, she's a, uh, an engineer from URI and right. actually worked at BDI for a little <laughs> while, right that's, after college. That's, that's cool. <laughs> I didn't know that. And, uh, you know, this is probably the, you know, I'll know if she actually listens to my podcast, if, if she says something at the end of this one. Now, if she just says, hey, great podcast, it doesn't mention this section, I'll know she's fibbing. Right. Right. <laughs> she doesn't think your podcasts are all that good. <laughs> uh, but um, so, so I have, uh, you know, a pretty good concept of what DFMA is right. all about. Uh, you could probably answer this question, by the way. What is the perfect number of parts to have in an assembly? Uh, 
Well, there's two answers. The, the, there, one or design it out and none. None, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the best part is no part. But um, it's, uh, it's the thing with design for manufacturing and assembly, it, it certainly doesn't roll off the tongue. It's not sexy like Six Sigma. It's not new. Nobody has ever said Six Sigma was sexy to me. You are a first. Uh, well, <laughs> well, it it, uh, it did have maybe it's run its course, but you know in the uh, mid '90s it, it was cutting edge and, and and it was sexy. But I guess now lean has been kind of uh, associated with really uh, huge business results and uh, you know really an important business methodology. But uh, design for manufacturing a an assembly is like the kind of Rodney danger field of uh, business methodologies. It gets no respect. <laughs> um, it, it just so happens to make more money for than, than lean and six Sigma combined by a factor of five or 10. And um, what's interesting is that uh, the, the cost saving stuff and the cost reductions, uh, namely uh, lean really has, has focused on the process you know, the process, the waste and all that. And what, what I've come to discover through design for manufacturing and assembly is actually the, 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 the design, the product governs process and, and the process looks the way it does and has the cost, um, as it does because the product demands it, meaning your factory is big because your product is big. Um, you have funny, uh, expensive processes because your product demands it. And this design for manufacturing and assembly is a way of thinking about the the product itself as a cost controller, cost driver. So you can actually look at the product itself as what creates cost and understand where the cost is and design it out. And then from there, you introduce a low waste design to the lean folks and they reduce the process waste. Now, this is kind of backward thinking from the, the traditional lean people where they're saying, you know, process drives product. Um, maybe so, but now it's time to flip it on its head and really, you know, you can reinvent your supply chain, get rid of the problem supplier if you design that, you know, element out of your product. And there's no other way to, to get rid of them uh, because, you know, the, if the product demands it. And, and this is, I think this is an important, um, piece. Most of my readers may not be really aware of, um, DFMA or have heard of Boothroyd Dewhurst software, but it is a philosophy, not a tool necessarily. So BDI just happens to have tools that assist you with that philosophy. It's not like CAE is a technique, right? Or right, FEA right. is a technique. Right. Yeah. It, it's a way, it's a way of thinking and, and you can do it. And I have done the methodology with uh, paper and pencil, you know, worksheets kind of stuff, but but it it uh, it it drives uh, simplicity, design simplicity through part count reduction. You know, there it's routine to be able to reduce part count, you know, by fifty percent, and uh, you know that's significant. You know, and and with that part count reduction comes cost reductions in the 50% range, they're typical. Actually, they're so big that it's almost a detriment to to, to DFMA because people don't take it seriously. They don't believe it. They don't believe it if you say something that extreme. Right. They say, well, you know, you're crazy, Mike. We've been doing this for, you know, 25 years. We're the world leader. Don't you think that if we could have taken 50% of the cost out, we would have done that? The answer I give them is, well, no one's ever taught you how. And certainly you don't believe it's possible. Uh, but here, this is how you do it. And it's, it's, uh, it's almost like a step-by-step, uh, process, not of doing, but of thinking of adding, um, a lens of simplicity to, to product design. You know, the, the best engineers can design with the fewest parts. And, and it's like, I don't know if you remember the old show, name that tune where, you know, contestants would compete to try to name the tune in the fewest notes. Mm. And, and this, you know, I can do that in five notes. Well, I can do that in four notes. Go ahead. And they do it and they can, you know, it, it's like designing with the fewest parts. It's, it's, it's a higher level of design to do it that way. And 
but but really, I think engineers haven't been taught that. They don't really understand the magnitude of the impact that they can have. They can reinvent, you know, the the product, the cost signature of the product. Well, let's make this real concrete. And I hate to put you on a spot, uh, sure. but can you give a concrete example of? you know, some, some product, you know, be sure. it a chair or a ship or, you know, give us an idea of, you know, something that changed through DFMA and what the result of that was. Well, you know, uh, at Hypertherm, um, I, I inherited, uh, or as a inherited an engineering team and a product line where we had, you know, it just wasn't, uh, wasn't doing so well. It was pretty good, but it was an older product. And uh, we, we, a business leader and marketing manager, and I got in the room and said, okay, what does this thing have to do to, to really turn the industry on its head? And the answer was a, you know, a 35% cost reduction. Um, and um, you know, they, they looked at me and said, can you do that? I said, I don't know. I'll try. Hmm. And, and, and we ended up taking something that you know, had um, a, a, a thousand parts down to, to 500, something that took you know, 10 hours to build down to four. You know, I've, I've seen engineers take an assembly that has, um, you know, 70 parts and do it in 15 parts. Wow. And, and, uh, you, the, the way they do that is first of all, taking a shot at, you know, let me try this. I don't really believe it, but, uh, but okay, you're, you're going to be here to help. And then once you do it once or twice, they start believing it, and then it, you know, all hell breaks loose, and people are taking designing parts out that they they thought were main parts that could be eliminated. And and also the you know the next level after that is a move to designing parts for a lower cost manufacturing technology. For instance, going from machining to injection molding. The, you know, the only way to get there is to change the design itself. And that's what I think people are missing. They, they're looking solely at the manufacturing process, but they really can't control the, or change the fundamentals without changing the design first. So I want to pick up on uh, something I just heard there. Now, you said that when some of your guys got the idea from this, they would start going uh, gangbusters on it. So they would become sort of DFMA guys. They were infected yes. with it. Right. Um, so, so, you know, that happens pretty quickly and easily, and this is a revelation for a lot of engineers. Well, uh, it can't, it can be sure at, at first they view it as, you know, you're out of your mind, you know, 50% is not possible. And then you say, you acknowledge that in fact, yes, I am out of my mind and we're going to go <laughs> ahead and, and, and we're going to do it. And you teach them how, and here's the trick at, at the design review, they're, they're the ones that are showing the number of parts in the old product. And the number of parts in the new one. And, you know, I call it big bar, little bar, where one bar is a thousand parts and the one right next to it, the new one is 500. And then they get the credit for it. And then they, they present the same kind of results, uh, big bar, little bar with product costs. The old one cost X and the new one costs half, you know, 0.5 X. And once the company kind of realizes the magnitude of the change, and and the engineers realize that they're the only ones that can do this kind of thing. It it tends to feel good to everybody, and you don't have to twist arms. You you know you more have to focus and them on on the the right thing to attack really, and that's success. Well, you just hit on something else that uh, I like in your writing, and something that comes through pretty clearly to me at least is that you definitely have a handle on this human side of engineering. So that big bar, little bar, and, and just the, you know, knowing that the reason that the engineer is going to keep doing this is because he got credit for it and he felt good about it standing up in front of everybody and saying, Hey, look at, look at what I did here. Um, so, yeah. so how, how did you get so tapped into this psychological side? Um, I think probably doing it wrong first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> try, try, trying to just hammer home, maybe do this, do that. And, uh, no, but, but, uh, you know, engineering is a, is a people business with a technical component. Uh, product development is made up of people. It's a people system with technical elements. And you, I guess you could probably look at any, dom any domain, whether it's marketing or manufacturing companies are people systems. And I don't really know how I figured that out. Um, but, but making connections with people, 
understanding their motivation, which is not uh, oftentimes not monetary. It's otherly. It's it's they they want to be better. They they want to show themselves that they can do things that uh, they didn't think they could. They you know there there are these intrinsic motivations that are not about money. It's about wanting to do a good job. And if you can tap into that, and if the engineers really know that you're in it uh, to help them grow, to help them do better work, engineers just resonate with that. They really do. Well, that kind of insight, uh, you know, that's just a taste. You know, we, we've just talked about a couple of small little techniques, I guess, that uh, that you use. Right. But uh, one thing that I, that I really like about you is, uh, you know, you, you've been running this blog called uh, Shapolsky on Design. It's www.shapolsky.com. Uh, you want to spell that so we get it right? Yeah, sure. It's S-H-I-P as in Peter, U-L-S-K-I, and the dot .com is easy to spell. You are so prolific on this blog. And, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that I, I kind of consider you the Seth Godin of engineering. <laughs> Unfortunately, I doubt that many people in my audience know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, well, they, they should. He's, he's a brilliant, brilliant guy. And, and, uh, you know, my work is shaped kind of directly on, on his, his teaching. Yeah. Um, and he gets into the people stuff of this too. And, um, you know, taking the long term view and, uh, you know, he's been marvelous for me to read and uh, and to understand um, people. You know, there's one thing that um, I think if I could give some unsolicited advice is a book called Lynchpin that he wrote, which which says that um, we all have this magical ability to do something, to to be the inner inner person that you are, and. Um, we've been programmed to kind of squelch that, to sit down and, and uh, keep your head down. Um, and, and this idea of being a linchpin, being somebody that does work that is so good, they're indispensable. And, and w- what I have found personally is the, the only thing limiting that for me is me. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff inside me that was would have been uh, dormant hadn't I not said, you know what, I, I'm going to try to let this out. And, and I think that uh, engineers have this untapped wealth of uh, capability, of passion, of energy, of caring, that if, if I could just teach them to let it go and let it out, that, you know, engineers can reinvent a company, can reinvent an industry if they're charged and engaged. Uh, but that's really um, something you have to supply yourself. And um, oftentimes, you know, you, you look to your boss or you look to your company and say, well, somebody's going to ask me. No, no, no. That's wrong. No one's going to ask you to, to be a linchpin. You have to look inside and say, you know, this is I'm going to give this a go. I may fall on my face, but you know what? I'm tired of doing the same work in the same way, and, and I'm going to take a shot at it. I always wanted to do this, and I'm going to try it. And I think that that is what I've learned, and and that is what I try to create a, an environment so that the engineers actually can can get there themselves. And it, I'm, I guess I'm calling out to all engineers, saying you, know, you do have all this great stuff inside, and the reason why it's not coming out is because of you. Um, so let it out. Uh, you know, the, the the real fear is actually not of failure; it's of success, because we all no kind of we're really good but we're not so comfortable about the impact of letting everybody else know that well there's um you know if, if you look at your blog there's this you have to go to the blog chapolsky.com uh look on the right scroll down to the category section if you're in engineering or engineering leadership and you don't see some topic in this category list that resonates directly with you I guess you're just not really an engineer, you know. I mean, this you, you co- or a business person. You cover so much great ground, and uh, one one of these uh, terms, which I'm wondering if you made up, it's called level five courage. What's that all yeah. about? I did I did make that up. Um, <laughs> well, well it, it has a nice ring to it. I mean, it's not level four; it's level five, <laughs> right? It's it's. Um, I guess you know the the first post I wrote with that is about a rodeo clown. Um, you know, the rodeo clown looks like uh, a clown, you know, makeup and baggy pants and holes and suspenders. Um, 
you know, I haven't been to a rodeo, but I guess I'm imagining this. What you know, people go to the rodeo to see the guy riding the bull, right? Scary. Oh my God, what a brave individual! And and they go to see him. But when the when the the cowboy's on the bull in the shoot, the cowboy's looking for the clown because mm. the clown is the brave one. Here's why: when when the cowboy falls off the bull, what does the cowboy do? He, he runs, runs away from. <laughs> <laughs> runs away from the bull. What does the clown do? Runs right he towards runs it. toward the bull. And and so this this level five courage is like, hey, my job is to put myself between the pointy parts of the bull and the cowboy. That's my job. And it takes courage. And the part that I kind of wanted to write about in that post is you can't – the clown looks like a clown. You know what I mean? He ain't, he ain't no clown. And so you can't see level five courage all the time. It doesn't, it sometimes looks backwards. It sometimes looks like something else. But the, 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 the clown does the level five work because he's a clown. Cause that's what he does. You know, this is innate things. And it, it, and the level five courage is to step outside your, your limits and, and and let yourself be what you can be. That's the courage. The courage to to say something in a meeting that everybody's thinking, but doesn't have the gumption to say. Like you know what, we've been doing this so long. I'm tired. I'm so tired of doing this. Work. We got to do it that way. And then the whole room just kind of uh, just lets out a huge sigh and goes, you know what, that's right. We, we got to do that. The level five courage is to say that stuff or to try, in the case of an analysis or tool, try a new analytical approach that people thought is, is um, misappropriate, not appropriate and, and, and flat out wrong. But, but what you know, it isn't, mm. you know, that's, it's a, it is a term I've made up, but um, you know, I, I think we need more of it. Well, uh, let me read through, and, and we're not going to discuss each one of these. Uh, actually, I think we're probably coming to an end here. But uh, again, I just want to give a flavor of some of the things you'll find at this blog, and then I have a question about your blogging after. So um, I see things like allocating costs, assembly time reduction, axiomatic design, uh, bottom line growth. Geez, that's a good idea. Um, <laughs> cost savings, culture. Uh, some of my favorites are uh, you know, what you do around culture. Engineering yeah. leaders, floor space, fundamentals, green, uh, intellectual inertia. That's an interesting one. Um, <laughs> part count reduction we, we touched on. Uh, let's see. Seeing things as they are. I think that's some, some of what you were just saying. Design yeah. for Six Sigma, technology, trees, uh, voice of the customer, warranty costs. So, And I skipped over about 20. <laughs> you are so prolific with this and you're covering such rich territory. Why are you doing this? I mean, why not just uh, do that and make your current com company successful? Why are you putting it out there to help everyone? Um, because I think, I think uh, it's important to help uh, engineers, um, technologists um, to improve the, the economy. Uh, I, I, I really want to move the needle on the U.S. economy, uh, and I want to reach engineers and technologists um, in a way that that um, they have the confidence uh, and the knowledge to to make a make a huge dent in things, to to create industries that don't exist through innovation, engineering, technology. Um, you know, I, I told my son. Uh, you know, I, I want to over the next 30 years or so be able to say I, I, I actually made it made the country better, uh, helped pay for bridges, roads, schools, uh, health care through influencing and, and helping engineers in, in the country. I, I, you know, that's my goal. Nothing short of um, changing the game. I want to be able to pay for pay for health care. Uh, have a country have safe bridges and roads. That may be a crazy thing, and it you know may be tilting at windmills, but that's what I'm going after. Well, every every Wednesday. That, that's a pretty powerful mission. <laughs> that's uh, actually I didn't know that was what you were going to say. That's uh, 
that's bigger than you or me. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sometimes it's too big, but I just try to I just try to uh, explain things that I think need to be explained. Try to reach people uh, that need to be reached. You know, I had one of the best comments I ever I ever got from a blog post was from a an engineering student who's just getting out, and and he said. You know, I I got out of engineering and, and I'm getting a job. And he said, you know, I am just so excited about doing engineering work after reading your blog. I just can't wait to do this. And you know, this was one one kid, probably 23 years old, not much experience, but just jazzed up to go after it. And and that's what I want to build and spread and create. Yeah. So you. Uh... Not only can you write and write well, uh, not only can you present and present well, but you're very accessible in social media. So I see you having conversations with that, uh, you know, engineering leader or uh, beginning student equally. Uh, you're very active on Twitter and Facebook and everywhere else. So, right. um, you know, how can people get a hold of you? What's what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Uh, sure. Um, um, email Mike at Shapolsky.com. I have a LinkedIn working group, uh, systematic DFMA deployment. Just uh, send me a note or just say I want to be part of it. Uh, and then you'll you'll be in a group of like-minded folks that are discussing this kind of stuff. Twitter, uh, uh, at Mike Shapolsky. Uh, and, and follow me or send me – start with email. But, um, you know, I do – I guess I'm most proud of my, my website and my blog. So – Subscribe to my blog, uh, com, and comment and share it. And if you if, if something touches you or moves you, then send it to 10 people and do the same for them. And I think that's a, a, a way that we engineers can actually build a movement, kind of 10 people at a time. And, uh, and I hope you do that. Well, we covered a ton of ground today. And um Again, if you read through some of these blog posts, you know, while this interview might have been a mile wide and an inch deep, uh, Mike does tend to take these topics uh, one at a time, an inch wide and a mile deep. So, you know, dig in on each any of these topics. And and Mike, um, you know, I think what might be good, and I'm going to put you on the spot again here, but sure. uh, I'd like to have you back in the future and maybe we'll pick uh, one of these very confined uh, areas to discuss and uh, dig in a little bit more. Absolutely. We'd love to do it, Jeff. Thanks. Uh, you got it. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, I right. really appreciate uh, the time and look forward to the next one. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it, man. That's all for this episode. Thanks for listening to the Life Upfront Engineering Podcast. Visit lifeupfront.com to comment and connect with me on Twitter, Google Plus, and LinkedIn. Also, you can really help the show by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again. Until next time.